Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. Today I'm going to present you my thesis entitled Improving Sound Retrieval in Large Collaborative Collections. So digital sounds nowadays take a major part of our life, maybe mainly for entertainment purposes. First, in audiovisual productions such as movies, a lot of audio clips are added, a lot of the audio content is added in a post-production process. And this is done simply because the recorded uh, noise and things are, are not appropriate, or that for any kind of artistic reasons for augmenting the dramatic impact of the movies, they may add some sounds, exaggerated sounds, for example. In the context of music, uh, a lot of artists and producers use and rearrange uh, audio clips in order to create entire music pieces. There are many other applications such as websites, radio shows or video games, and more generally in the context of human machine interface. Maybe more interesting for you, for researchers, uh, audio data are a very valuable resource that you will use, for example, when training and, and developing some machine learning algorithms. So these sounds are often, they, also, they often originate from sound collections where they are aggregated. And we can divide them in two categories. First, the professional ones that are often of specific use and recorded in professional studios. They have the advantage of being very well organized and annotated, which can facilitate the exploration, the retrieval of the content there. They are usually of very high quality. However, they can be sometimes expensive. And for example, what if a sound designer is only interested in, in one specific sound and doesn't really have the budget to buy an entire professional sound collection? So as an alternative, collaborative collections are created by their users. And this makes them sometimes free or at least less expensive than the professional ones. However, they suffer from being not uniformly annotated, meaning that the user didn't necessarily agree on using a set of predefined and, and well-defined categories. They tend to be very large, and these two things make them quite hard to bruise, and it's hard sometimes to retrieve content from them compared to professional ones, at least harder in the case of professional ones. This sound collection also, they tend to be very large, as I said, and very diverse. Here I represented uh, um, a tag cloud of the free sound content. So basically the bigger the tag is, the more current it is in the collection. You can already see a lot of musical instruments with synthesizer, uh, bass, percussion, uh, and so on. You can also find environmental sound, water, birds, uh, and so on. So, uh, how do people retrieve content? How do they interact with these sound collections? Well, the, the traditional pipeline can be summarized a bit as follows. So a user would submit a text query uh, through an interface and the search engine will then match this query to some indexed metadata like tags, description, the text that is accompanying the sounds. Then the system will send back some results to the user. And that's how basically it would work here. Um, so I already talked a bit about FreeSound. Let me introduce it, introduce it a bit further. Uh, it's a sound sharing platform that was created around 15 years ago here in the Music Technology Group. And it hosts a, coll uh, a, collection, uh, a collaborative collection of sounds. And it contains today uh, nearly half a million sounds. It's quite dynamic because every week we get around 1,000 new sounds. All these sounds are shared using Creative Commons licenses, which can facilitate the sharing and the reuse of the content. So as a personal motivation, when I entered here, uh, the music technology, uh, I, I really wanted to find a way to contribute to FreeSound, to improve its value. Uh, so the main objective that I fixed quite early was to find ways to improve the exploration and the retrieval uh, of sounds in these large collaborative collections. And uh, I did that from different perspectives. First, uh, I focused on providing and investigating methodologies in order to create high quality data sets. Also by investigating some manual annotation tools that can help providing better annotation for our data set. These things can then be used, for example, uh, to improve some classification algorithm that could be used for automatically uh, generating new metadata for the content and eventually improve the retrieval of the content there. 
Uh, and in particular, we are we will be interested here uh, in we were interested in unsupervised classification as clustering being uh, a nice way for enabling some uh, exploratory uh, processes. As an alternative uh, to create high quality data set and, and generate a lot of labels, um, we try to find some approach uh, in order to learn representation directly using the content from the collaborative sound collection, meaning the audio content and the metadata associated with the content, usually in forms of tags or text. And finally, as a practical application to solve our goal, to propose a solution to, to improve the retrieval of sounds, we investigate the use of search results clustering in the sound context. Search result clustering is a technique that aims at uh, identifying subgroups uh, in the search result, and it can enable the user to maybe more quickly retrieve some sound or identify some, some subtopics that uh, were retrieving his queries, we will see, as we will see later. So the outline of this presentation will roughly follow uh, this line of ideas. Let's start with the uh, first section, um, dealing with data collection and providing some methodologies for building high quality data sets, mostly for supporting researchers' needs. So data sets are a key resource for researchers and also creative professionals like sound designers. Uh, in the context of researchers, uh, in the context of machine learning, uh, this kind of data is usually used for developing, for training and benchmarking different algorithms. So based on the usage of this data set, we highlight here some kind of principle that we found important uh, in order to uh, to facilitate, I mean, to make it useful for their users, the users of this data set. So first, this data set must be large enough in order to support data hungry machine learning algorithms. The data needs to be completely open so that anyone can just download the data and use it for his own purpose. We want the process of data collection and annotation to happen in a completely transparent manner so that we can detect any flaw or mistake that happen and, and take some actions in order to overcome them. We want to have a diversity that is representative of the real world, depending on the application. For example, if we're interested uh, in developing some models to automatically annotate the content and organize the content from uh, online sound collections, then we want to have data set that covers the wide range of sounds that the collection there uh, proposes. If we're interested in monitoring uh, urban soundscapes, for example, we want to have data sets that cover the diversity that we'd find in, acoustic, uh, in, in urban acoustic soundscapes. We want to uh, have uh, the creation uh, of the data set to happen in a dynamic manner so that we can improve through times in terms of quality and quantity. And finally, we want all this to happen in a sustainable manner so that through the years, we can get to better data sets. So what do we mean in our case uh, as data set? Well, we simplify it, we consider it as, as follows. First, a bunch of audio files. In our case, FreeSound uh, is a particularly situated source uh, of audio files. It is large and, and quite dynamic, so we will get new sounds uh, through, through the years. Uh, we need a set of predefined categories. And finally, a set of annotations uh, that associate some of these categories to some of the audio files. The categories that we use typically for annotating the content are nowadays usually organized in big hierarchies, such as the one presented here. We call these hierarchies taxonomies, and they're interesting because they can, for example, guide the process of annotation, as we will see later, or they can simply help uh, annotators to understand the categories uh, and their context. A few years ago was released the audio set ontology and it's a taxonomy that has more than 600 classes organized in a hierarchy. Here you can visualize the two first layers of this hierarchy. It was the biggest, I mean, it's the biggest that is publicly available. And it's quite, uh, quite interesting for us because it's able to cover the wide range of everyday sounds that we can find, for example, in online sound sharing platform, such as FreeSound. 
it's quite rich because it includes description, examples, and URI for each of the categories, which are things that can be used uh, when trying to facilitate or guide the process of manual annotation of audio content. So we kind of have all the pieces. We need a source of content with FreeSound, a set of categories with the audio set ontology. And finally, I developed and maintained a platform, FreeSound Annotator, where a community of contributors could provide annotations for our data set. And with that in mind, we, we first wanted to create a data set called FSD, which was of large scale and of general purpose with any kind of audio data in it. So how did we start um, the creation of this data set? We first started by generating candidate annotation, by generated annotations automatically based on the metadata of the sounds, their tags. This produced a lot of candidate annotation that we then ask people to validate with this simple uh, task here. So in here, a user is asked to validate the presence of an accordion in the following sounds. This way, we gathered a lot of contributions from different users uh, in the terms of votes. In here is represented through uh, the year, uh, the number of contribution we gathered in the platform. We first uh, started by organizing some annotation events where, as you can see in these pictures, uh, we gathered some people in a control scenario. And this enabled us here to, as you can see in this figure, uh, obtain uh, some annotations, some first annotation, uh, test our platform and gather some important feedback that, that was then used to improve the platform and open it to the crowd. We then organized some campaigns and we gathered, uh, well, I mean, we, we obtained a lot of co different contributors that provided su sufficiently more annotations there. This allowed to generate in total more than 80,000 grant truth annotations. And these grant truth annotations were used for creating different kinds of data sets that actually had a really uh, great impact in the research community. So let me go more uh, into detail about other approaches we use in order to uh, annotate the content in a more appropriated way. So the automatically generating annotations uh, had some drawbacks. And first, it could fail to generate some labels, or it could generate labels that were not specific enough. So we had the idea to focus on one tool for uh, generating the missing labels, which is called the manual annotator here, and another which aimed at uh, refining, uh, precising further some existing labels with the refinement annotator. Moreover, we wanted to investigate tools that could be eventually add, added into sound sharing platform and um, enable the content, the people that share the content to directly annotate the content. Our validation task was suited more in a post-process scenario where people annotate the content after. Now here we wanted really to also investigate things that can directly beneficiate uh, sound collections. So here is how one of the main features of the manual annotator looks like. It's this table that is expandable and bruisable and conveys the hierarchy uh, within the classes. The refinement annotator lists um, some existing labels and enables the users to specify, to investigate related categories and specify further some existing labels. So uh, we uh, set up some experiments with users. And the idea here was to observe uh, the use of this prototype uh, in a real context. We gathered eight participants from different levels of expertise. And here the idea was to see how consistent were the label produced by, different, by people with different backgrounds. We uh, collected a bunch of challenging sounds to annotate, either containing multiple sources, huge background noise, or that were simply hard to recognize. And here, the idea was just to put our uh, annotation tools to the test. I, as the examiner, I stayed present during uh, the, the, the task while they were performing the, the task. I first provided them with some guidelines and explanations. After uh, they finished the task, I provided them with some usability questionnaires and conducted some semi-structured interviews. 
The results were analyzed using thematic analysis as a way to draw some discussions around emerging and recurrent themes from the participant answers and behaviors. Here are some of the insights. The user found very useful this idea of using a text-based text search engine in order to retrieve, to find categories uh, in, the, in the taxonomy. And it provided them a way uh, to find categories using their own word. This was particularly efficient when uh, the annotator uh, recognized the source and wanted to quickly uh, add the category to the content. However, it failed uh, in some cases, for example, when the annotator was not familiar with the vocabulary or when he just didn't recognize the sound source. In this case, uh, the taxonomy table was sometimes helpful. Uh, in here, we represent the hierarchy and we enable people to, uh, as you can see here, uh, expand and bruise uh, this. So it can engage them in an exploratory process where they can maybe learn about new classes and understand a bit more the, the taxonomy and eventually uh, find some ca interesting categories to annotate the content. However, this can be very time consuming. There are, there are more than 600 categories here. It's impossible to visualize them all at once. Uh, and, and it's also very hard to keep in mind all these categories. I mean, uh, I, I spent years over there and I'm still missing some, uh, some points there. I mean, some categories, it's really hard uh, to use them. So uh, with that in mind, the, the refinement annotator tries to simplify the task by only, only showing relevant categories at each steps here. So as you can see here, we only show relevant categories that can be sibling or uh, children categories in the hierarchy. And the user there doesn't need to have in mind all the ontology and can, can, we can maybe facilitate his work there. However, it was observed that uh, several users missed important categories with this approach. Actually, relevant categories are not just the one that are close uh, in the hierarchy, uh, but they can also be in other places. And, and this way we didn't achieve really um, exhaustive annotation or annotating all the, the meaningful categories for audio clips. What about consistency? I said that it was a, an interesting thing we wanted to see, see if we can open, for example, these tools to the crowd and do they provide consistent labels there? Uh, well, we observed that users tend to use different categories to annotate the same content. This was particularly true with the manual annotator, which aimed at generating new labels. The number of uh, average, the average number of labels produced by the participants was 24. However, the total of unique labels they generated with this tool was 70. With the refinement annotator, this problem was mitigated. However, we observed uh, uh, variability in terms of amount of effort produced, and some users spent over one hour annotating the content without really producing better or more annotation there. In fact, it was observed that they were trying to understand the taxonomy and explore it with, with this tool of refinement that, that is not meant for it. So to conclude this section, uh, we investigated some manual annotation tools in order to fix specific problem induced by our data collection process, and then can facilitate the use of large taxonomies to annotate the content. The manual, the manual annotator that aimed at generating new labels was actually intensively used for curating some parts of the FSD data set to get some exhaustive annotation for some of our content. Finally, these tools were not tested in the context of sound sharing platform, which is left for future work here. Let's move on into the section uh, where we compare uh, different audio features in terms of performance for the unsupervised classification of sounds, clustering. So clustering is very useful for data exploration as it can find similarities within the data or discover, help discover underlying structures. These methods make use of a similarity measure between sounds in our case. And these measures are obtained by applying some distance or similarity metric over some numerical features, over a feature space. 
Uh, the audio features that we want to compare are, well, first the traditional acoustic features uh, that were obtained through a feature engineering process where um, people developed some uh, signal processing pipeline to extract numerical values from the data, from the audio, uh, from the sounds that would reflect some low level characteristic of the content. Recently, deep learning has enabled to learn such features directly uh, directly from the data by training models in classification tasks or on a self-supervised way. For the clustering approach, uh, we were particularly interested in this uh, graph-based clustering approach and, and it works as follows. So in this graph, each node represents a sound, corresponds to a sound. And we connect, we connect each node to its k nearest neighbors according to our similarity metric. Then we employ a graph partitioning algorithm in order, in order to obtain the clusters here that are represented as colors here. So there are different ways to evaluate clustering performance and, and it's actually not that easy. Uh, the, literature, uh, uh, the literature distinguishes uh, internal validations uh, as being some metric use that do not make use of uh -huh. external information. Uh, this metric use only audio features that are thrown uh, to the clustering algorithm. They often kind of uh, reflect how homogeneous are content within uh, a cluster and how distinctive they are from objects in other clusters. They're often used for hyperparameter optimization. For example, in the case of k-means, to automatically find the number of clusters uh, in advance, or for comparing the performance of different algorithms with one set of features. Sorry, I would ask someone from the audience that has the mic turned on and is making a lot of noise to turn yeah, it off. I, I, I'm sending a message, but I think he's not reading it. If I don't know if the host is here he, and has permission. It. It's done. I it's think done. I, I saw. Okay. Thank you, Sergi. Uh, so let's continue. Uh, I said there were two types of, of uh, metrics uh, to evaluate this. And the second type that are more interested for us are the external validations that make use of some sort of external information that usually takes uh, form as ground truth labels. And luckily we have spent some time and a lot of effort annotating content with some semantic categories. And we can therefore rely on, on such an approach to evaluate our clustering. These methods are usually preferred and they can be suited for comparing the performance of the entire clustering systems. And also for, in our case, what we are more interested in, comparing the performance of different audio features in terms of how well they can um, enable to find some clusters that convey some semantic um, relations, some semantic attributes of the data. So we designed some experiment where we compare uh, the performance of two clustering methods, first k-means, and then the graph-based approach I just uh, presented. We compare the performance of different audio features. For the traditional one, we use the MFCCs. Uh, and for the deep learning models, we use different pre-trained embeddings from the literature. Uh, first, the audio set embeddings, which are trained on a supervised way on a classification task. The OpenL3 embeddings are trained on a self-supervised way by taking advantage of audiovisual correspondences in videos. And finally, SoundNet are also trained on a self-supervised way by, by, by transferring knowledge from a visual pre-trained network to an audio embedding model. Um, so to evaluate uh, our clustering and, and features, uh, we created several data sets, 44, organized in six families, as you can see in the table here. So the way we created this data set was to take one category from the taxonomy, from the hierarchy, and take as classes only uh, the direct children of such categories. Uh, so this, for example, would uh, create some uh, data set very broad, like the natural data set from the natural data family itself, which contains very broad classes and some more specific uh, data sets, such as the water one that will contain more uh, specific uh, classes that are deeper in the hierarchy. So this way we created a uh, very diverse data set with different type of content, which allow us to see how the features are performing in different contexts. 
And also this idea of having different levels of specificity, how I just explained. For comparing the performance, we rely on a specific metric that is the adjusted mutual information, which has been shown to be particularly suited uh, in the case when we have unbalances in the ground truth labels, when the data uh, is unbalanced, and that's what we can typically find uh, in online sound collection. So this score goes uh, from minus one to one, and a score of zero means uh, that it is random, it, it obtains random partition, and a score of one would mean a perfect match to the clusters. So here are some of the results. And in here, we uh, show the average mutual information score, average per family here. No, there are several data sets per family. First, we see that uh, training an embedding model on a supervised task is what gives us the best performance here with the audio set embedding. Then we see that self-supervised techniques can also enable to obtain embedding models that can be suitable for clustering purpose. And in particular, we see that when we train a model in a particular uh, domain with specific kind of content, for example, the OpenL3 music was trained with musical data only, we obtain better um, performance in the case of musical instrument. And with the OpenL3 uh, embedding train with environmental sounds, we obtain better performance in the case of natural sounds. So we could, for example, train different models in specific domains and then maybe rely on different of them, depending on what type of content we are addressing, or we, are, we are using. Finally, uh, SoundNet does not seem to be very suitable for clustering purposes. Uh, although in the context of supervised classification, it provides uh, good uh, discriminative features uh, in the unsupervised scenario, it doesn't seem to help with results very close uh, to randomness. So what about comparing the, the two clustering algorithm? Well, first, the k-means approach has uh, the disadvantages that it needs to be provided with the number of clusters in advance. We also observed a higher variability in terms of performance as shown in these box plots here. The k nearest neighbor graph approach uh, doesn't need to be specified with the number of cluster. However, it has one hyperparameter, which, which is k, the number of nearest neighbors we consider. And uh, some informal experiments show that uh, as soon as we had a k that was large enough, uh, the, the performance was not really affected uh, by changing its value. However, keeping uh, a k value low enough will uh, ensure uh, low computational costs. In here, uh, we plotted uh, the two first component of a PCA representation using the audio set embeddings as the features for the wind instrument data set. So here, each color corresponds to one of the labels, our ground truth here. Here is what we obtain with uh, the different clustering algorithm. And here first with k-means, we see that the clusters uh, represented by different colors here uh, appear very slightly overlapped here. However, when we look at the cane and graph approach, uh, we see that these clusters appear quite uh, overlapped, which seem to be more corresponding of the reality of our ground truth labels here. So here the conclusion, cane and graph seems to be um, more useful or it's more easy with it to discover higher dimensional structures within our data. So to summarize this part, well, we first compare the performance of different features uh, for clustering purpose using different data sets uh, to, to, uh, so to have the idea of performance in different contexts of use. Uh, we show that training, uh, that deep learning embedding, sorry, can be used for clustering uh, purposes in the context of diverse sound collections. Uh, Training embedding models in a specific domain may provide better result be within this restricted domain. Finally, there is this idea of supervised approaches that make use of uh, data that has been annotated with ground truth labels uh, that achieve very good performance here and self-supervised approach that can benefit a uh, more important amount of data. So let's move on into the next part. 
um, providing some methods in order to learn audio representation directly using content from the sound collaborative collection. So instead of building data set and use labels, um, uh, manually annotated labels to train our embedding model or by training it in a totally self-supervised way, we want to find an in-between where we take advantage of the content and the metadata provided in this platform and see what we can achieve in terms of learning representation that can serve as a base for different purposes. So uh, deep learning uh, has enabled to achieve very high performance, but it requires a sufficient amount of, of labeled data, which can be in some cases difficult to obtain or, or just costly. Uh, today, we can find a large amount of real-world recordings available online, but its exhaustive annotation would require a lot of effort. So the objective, as I said before, is to learn an audio representation that can serve as a base for different applications uh, in the field of machine listings. We want to take advantage of uh, online audio content, which is very diverse, that is present in large quantity, but that is weakly annotated in the sense that uh, the user didn't necessarily agree, agree on using some specific categories to annotate the content, but rather use some kind of free form text or tags uh, to annotate the content with their own word. So we took inspiration from different works from the literature. And one of them is this idea of contrastive learning in a self-supervised way. So in here, the authors uh, use some image so in, in this example here, X, one Im image, and they apply different transformation. They apply some different data augmentation methods and obtain different image here that are associated. They originate from the same image. They then input these images to a neural network, the function F, and obtain some latent representation. These representation are then thrown to uh, what we usually call projection heads. And finally, here we obtain ZI and ZJ, which are uh, where we try to push uh, to bring them closer in the embedding space and push them further away from any other content within a batch when training. Another interesting work is this idea of aligning the representation, the internal representation of autoencoders. So in this article, um, the authors propose uh, to use uh, an autoencoder for processing image data and another for processing the accompanying text uh, information about the image. And to the traditional variational autoencoder approach, they add some cross reconstruction losses that they aim from one modality embedding, reconstruct the other modality. So in here from the text embedding, re reconstruct the image, vice versa. And also adding some distribution alignment uh, losses here. So this way they were able to infuse some semantics from the text-based model into the image-based model. And their context of use was zero-shot learning where they aimed at providing, at developing some classifiers that could uh, predict classes that were unseen during training. For example, here, nothing appears about a, bir a bird, but these kind of properties maybe can help then uh, to assess if this is a bird or not. So in our case, we were very interested in this idea of autoencoder since you can, uh, in a self-supervised way, take any data, make use of any data. But we wanted to uh, relax the alignment uh, methods and, and use it more in a contrastive learning approach. I mean, use some more contrastive learning approach. So in here, we use one autoencoder for processing audio, and in particular, the spectrogram extracted from the audio. And another autoencoder for processing the tags. The tags here are represented as multi hot encoded vectors. Um, and we then uh, add some projection heads and finally maximize the agreement here, align these two representations in order to infuse some semantics from the tags into the audio embedding model. So the result is this audio embedding model here that can be used then as a feature extractor as we will see later. So to train that, we use data from Freeson. We collect more than 200,000 audio clips and extract two second spectrograms. We consider uh, 1000 tags for describing this content. We use different losses for the audio reconstruction the tag reconstruction, and finally for the agreement loss, for the alignment, 
we rely on the antics and clause, which was the one used in the first paper I mentioned. For the architectures, uh, we go for some fully convolutional uh, neural network for the audio encoder. For the decoder, we use the counterpart of uh, convolutional transpo transpose convolutions. For the text model, um, we use fully connected layers here. And finally, these uh, projection heads here are kept very simple. It's just one uh, fully connected layer. And the idea here is to have a simple way to maybe get rid of some um, information re reflected in some embeddings that cannot be reflected in the other embedding and vice versa. So when we train that, we can al already visualize these embeddings. And in here, I use a TSN representation of the audio uh, embeddings in red and in blue, the tag, the associated tag embeddings. And this is done on the validation set here. So you, uh, one thing is that I draw a line between the associated audio embedding and the tag embedding. So we can see how they, they relate there in this space. So we naturally see some clusters that are mapped to other clusters in the other modality. When we inspect a bit more, um, we see that sometimes uh, some tag embedding are close from each other uh, in the space, but their associated audio representation end, in, end up far from each other here. And uh, here we have two symbol sounds. Uh, they share very similar tags, but they sound quite different. Let, let's listen to them. So this is a hi-hat that is very short. And uh, this one, this is a China type of symbol that is very sustained and has different components. Here actually you see in the free sound player, the color here, the more reddish color conveys some idea that the, the spectral components are higher uh, in the spectrum, they have higher frequency there. Um, on the contrary, here we have two examples that are close from each other in the audio embedding space, but their associated tag representation are far from each other. And uh, this sound here is a, a drop splashing into water. And this one is actually very different. It's someone pressing a key on a tape recorder. So semantically very different. And let's listen to it. Well, it is quite different perceptually. Maybe they just share in common that they are very brief there. Uh, a final example, in here we have again two audio representations that are close from each other and their tag representation and the far from each other. So let's listen to them. So we, these are some bird sounds uh, that appear kind of a bit distorted, no? But we can still recognize some bird squeaks. And this one is actually a sound effect that was obtained by by proce heavily processing some sound, and this is how it sounds. So it is quite different, but maybe among these, these sounds here, it, it may uh, share some kind of perceptual properties here uh, in terms of frequency components, for example. So these behaviors here of the model seem kind of um, reasonable. So, we decided to move on into some proper experiments. And in here, the idea was to compare different models in a two-step approach. First, we train a deep audio embedding model, and then we evaluate it as a feature extractor in different target classification tasks. We perform some ablation study in order to answer questions such as, is the contrastive loss framework working in such a heterogeneous scenario, meaning that we are processing audio information, audio data in, with one, uh, encoder and with the other we are processing text data is adding the autoencoder uh, auto encoder architecture is adding this um, this uh, reconstruction objective useful for learning better feature here finally we also perform some correlation analysis with acoustic descriptors in order to understand what kind of properties are reflected in our embeddings so these are the downstream classification tasks where we evaluate our model. First, the sound event classification task with the urban sound data set, the music jaw classification, 
uh, using the full filtered version of the GTSAN dataset. And finally, uh, the instrument classification problem with the NC dataset. Here, however, instead of taking the entire training set, which is quite large, we only we, we sample less than 10% of this data in order to see how our embedding models were performing in the context of you know, relatively small data sets. So here are the results when training a multi-layer perception uh, with one hidden layer and uh, 10 uh, as output here, we always had 10 classes in these data sets. First, first we see that um, the contrastive learning approach is uh, providing some uh, embeddings that um, provide better results than our MFCC baseline, showing that it, it, we can, in this heterogeneous scenario, use this contrastive learning approach to learn features that can be used for classifying content into some semantic categories. Then we observe that when we had when we add the autoencoder architecture, the reconstruction objective, we obtain better results. And this is particularly true in the context of the NSYNC dataset. NSYNC contains a lot of very short one-shot sample, instrument samples. And therefore the intuition here is that uh, an autoencoder based on spectrogram may be able to capture some, uh, by itself capture some low level characteristic of the content related to his timber. And that may be quite suitable in this, in this task here. And this, is a, this intuition is a bit more validated with the correlation analysis we perform. So in here, uh, we display the canonical correlation with some acoustic descriptors. Um, and, um, um, and here we do it with the mean statistic of these features. So we, fer we see that when adding the autoencoder architecture, uh, we have better correlation, for example, with the MFCCs, it is quite clear, and, and it corresponds to some, I mean, it represents some aspect of the timber here. Finally, uh, with the chromogram features that are maybe more relevant in the context of musical content, which is a task where our features didn't work that well, we don't find a, such a, a good uh, increase in terms of uh, uh, correlation here. Sorry, there is someone again doing some uh, noise. Could the person uh, mute itself or himself? I'm sending a message as well. Thank you. You don't want to have the, the, you don't have the power, uh, yeah. One? Lydia? <laughs> Yeah, Livia could, could, could mute the people. Yeah, I don't know if she's completely here. I don't know. Maybe Chavi, you can contact her because we don't have uh, Lydia, I mean, because we don't have um, permissions to mute other people. And apparently, there's she's. I will try to contact Lydia, but I don't know if. I think that's what Chavi Person is Emilia to Sanchez, no? She's. I, I'm sending email, I read messages. Okay. Thank you. Well, I will just try to ignore it and and, uh, and continue. It's a bit disturbing. Anyway, ah. um, why I don't have the hand on that? Sí, que que lo estoy viendo. I don't know. Okay. okay. Um, now, now it worked. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um. So where was I? Sorry. So we saw that the, the correlation in some cases increased when we added this reconstruction objective, which is, which is fine. It seems that this feature can be used in more context of use and particularly for classifying instrumental uh, music instruments. It, it was beneficial. What about the clustering performance? Are the embeddings we learned can be used in the context of clustering? And in here, we perform again the external validation that I present in the last section. But here we could not use all the data because uh, most of them, a lot of them was used for training our embedding model. So we, we made sure to remove it there. However, we can find uh, similar kind of trends. The audio set embeddings are still performing better than the other. However, in some cases, we see that our features, our embeddings, uh, can provide good performance here, which is encouraging. 
So to summarize this section, um, first we show that uh, a contrastive, uh, the contrastive learning framework can be applied in a multimodal scenario with, by using an, an audio processing, uh, an audio model and a tag-based model. And this way learn some uh, audio representation that are enriched semantically. We saw that adding the autoencoder architectures can lead to better representation, representation that can reflect both acoustic and semantic properties of the content. Finally, the clustering performance without investing it too much seems to be encouraging here and showing that we can use such features in the unsupervised scenario. There were some limitations in our work, and one of them was this idea that the tag representation was fixed and our approach was not able to generalize to new terms not seen during training. One way to overcome this problem is to rely on pre-trained word embedding representation. But this brings, for example, the question of how can we aggregate the representation of different tags? So one sound is annotated with several tags. How can we aggregate all these tags to have to obtain one uh, embedding vector and align it to our audio embedding the same way we did it before. So we investigated the idea of self-attention in order to learn contextualized tag representation here. And the same as before, uh, we align this representation to the audio one and obtain some uh, enriched audio representation. The results were very comparable as before. We didn't observe any significant um, uh, improvement in the downstream classification task. However, maybe one interesting result here is that in this case, we investigated to use these projection heads here that are put between the embedding space and where we uh, do the alignment with the other modality. We use these projection heads here. And in this case, we could use them to reduce the dimension of the audio embedding, to change it and adapt it to the same dimension as the tag embedding. In fact, the tag embedding here uh, was taken with a much lower dimensionality. And this was done without hindering uh, really the, the performance of, of our uh, embedding, audio embedding. So let's move on into the, the next section, which um, treats this practical idea of search result clustering uh, in the context of sound, and that could help to directly um, um, improve the retrieval of sound in collaborative sound collections. So as I said at the beginning, uh, these collections tend to be quite large and very diverse. Um, as an example here, the dog query in Freesound retrieves more than 4,000 results. And the first result is a dog toy. The second one is a dog barking. And the third one is the sound of a dog walking. So the user may have to go through a lot of irrelevant results until he can uh, find uh, the sound, retrieve the sound that satisfies his particular need in his task. So one uh, solution to overcome this kind of problem is this idea of search result clustering, which aims at identifying some coherent groups in the results and enable the user to identify some useful subsets in their results. As an example here, uh, the Google image search engine provides such a feature. And after submitting a query, appear these kind of labels here at the top that identify here uh, some characteristics of the dog, such as their age, like, if there are babies or no, uh, some races of dogs, some characteristic as the color of the dog, or even the type of image, uh, the drawing here, if we want some drawings. In the context of web document, this has also been studied and there exist some, uh, some tools for doing, uh, for performing such an approach. And here, one of them here displays the cluster using some facets uh, that they call folders and enable the user to filter the results uh, from their search here and visualize them. Uh, these uh, YPs probably uh, the, were uh, such a feature is available with a collection of a very large collection of document of web document indexed here. And you can see the clusters are also shown as facets and they convey some kind of hierarchy here to help the user understand what kind of content uh, is present here in different clusters. 
So in our case, how do we do that? Well, first a user performs a search, submits a query to the system. We uh, retrieve some results. Then these results, uh, we extract audio features from them and we perform some nearest neighbor searches. We then build a nearest, we, we build the K nearest neighbor graph and we apply some graph partitioning algorithm commonly known as community detection algorithm in order to extract the clusters. These clusters are then shown to the users with different visualization interfaces that enable them to interact uh, with these results. We wanted here to find some ways to evaluate our system in its context of use and without necessarily having to rely on external ground truth data that can be costly to obtain. So what we did is that uh, for the 1000 most popular queries in Freeson, according to our internal logs, we, for each sound, uh, um, looked at the associated tags and extracted some numerical features from them in obtaining some tag based uh, um, features. What we did then is we used an internal validation score here to compare, uh, to assess the, the clustering performance here and compare the clustering uh, classes obtained, the partition, uh, according to the text based features that can uh, convey some kind of semantic aspects here, what is reflected from the tags. And we do that for the audio set embeddings that we used previously that perform, seem to perform very well and some low level traditional acoustic features. And we also compare that to a more traditional external validation approach in order to see if our validation here grants some, some similar results there. So we found again that the audio set embeddings outperform traditional handcrafted features. Then uh, the two evaluation we performed, the internal one that we propose here, uh, showed very similar performances, which shows that we are we can evaluate um, our methods uh, in its context of use there uh, without relying on external ground truth information. So for interacting with the cluster, we investigated two different ideas. One is the traditional facet filtering, where here on the right appear some facets that can be used to filter the content. By clicking on one is on this facet, the, the results here would be filtered and only the content of this cluster would appear. Uh, as an alternative uh, um, representation, we use this 2D visualization uh, of the graph where we enable user uh, to listen to sounds by simply hovering the mouse over the nodes here. So we designed some user experiment, we gather different participants, we engage for them into a music uh, making task uh, where we provided them with some musical loops um, and we asked them to retrieve all the content that they would need to eventually recreate these loops. Uh, we engaged the four other participants into a more sound design related task where they were shown a cartoon video without sound and they were asked again to retrieve all the content that would be needed in order to sonify uh, this video. We asked them to use as they wanted the two interfaces uh, I just presented. I provided them with some guidelines and explanations. I stayed present uh, during, the work, during their task and at the end, again, I, pro I provided them some usability questionnaires and conducted some semi-structured interview. This again was analyzed using thematic analysis as a way to draw some discussion around uh, merging and recurrent themes from their answers. So here are some of the results. First, they found quite useful uh, the labels uh, provided for each cluster. So as you can see here, uh, we show some labels for each of the cluster that are obtained using the tags. And this way they can, uh, it was observed that they could use them to simply understand what their searches, what, what was retrieved there. So, uh, and use that information, for example, maybe to reformulate the query or maybe start simply deciding to dig in more into these results here. They found particularly interesting the 2D visualization for fast exploration. So here, uh, the, um, the layout here displays the, the, the structure of the graph and the user could easily, uh, for example, start listening to some sound in one place, jump to, jump to another uh, in a kind of divergent way and, and 
finally uh, retrieve some more interesting content here. And, and they could do that, they felt uh, faster than with a normal uh, interface. Clustering was not very beneficial uh, in some cases. The task uh, we evaluated our uh, prototype with was very specific and, and the participants were asked to retrieve very specific content that they did that in sometimes submitting some very complex queries that involve several query terms there. And this returned very few results. And in these cases, it was simply, simply didn't make sense to, to cluster so many, so, so few results. Finally, after performing some experiments, we realized that in some cases, the labels that accompanying, uh, that were accompanying the clusters uh, were not helping. Here, you have many clusters that um, have exactly the same uh, labels. And therefore, we decided to extract audio examples uh, for each cluster so they could understand the, the, what each, uh, the difference between the, the content of each clusters. So to summarize this section, uh, we investigate the idea of uh, cluster search result clustering uh, in the context of freesound. Uh, we provided method in or, uh, that exploited the metadata of the content in order to evaluate such approach uh, at scale and without the need to involve any ground truth information and ground truth state. Uh, we gathered important feedback uh, for the system in order uh, to improve it. And uh, we, are now, we are now working into um, finalizing its implementation in the official FreeSound website where it could help potentially uh, a lot of users there. So let's start the conclusion. Let's finish with the conclusion of uh, my presentation. And uh, the main goal I, I tried to address here was to improve the exploration and the retrieval of sound in large collaborative collections. And we did that from different perspectives by first providing some methodologies for building high quality data sets for supporting mainly researchers needs. We investigated manual annotation tools that can enhance the ability to use it to understand and use large taxonomies to annotate the content. We provided some methods in order to learn audio representation by taking advantage of the content of the online sharing platforms and the associated metadata. We provided different methodologies in order to evaluate features and methods in the context of unsupervised classification of sounds. Finally, we investigated the use of search result clustering applied to sound and integrated into the free sound platform. So most of our work was uh, published or is under review process in different journal or conference papers. Uh, that's all for me. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, of course, my supervisor, the tribunal that is here and anyone that uh, I co collaborated with or any colleagues, uh, anyone in particular. Thank you very much.